Okay, um, let me get started. Uh, I am gratified to see some people have braved the storm and uh, made it to class. Um, today, uh, I, what my, my, my goal is going to be to, uh, first I want to talk about the, uh, finish up the lecture from last time about uh, evaluation. Then I will talk about the project uh, proposal, uh, re re proposals and results. And then we'll, we'll uh, go into uh, a new topic, linear algebra, if we have uh, time. Um, okay, any questions with that in mind? Probably not. Okay, so last class we were talking about uh, how do you evaluate classifiers? Remember, classifiers are, are programs that would uh, assign labels, try to predict labels of things, positive or negative is the usual case. Um, but but those that's for binary classifiers. Often we have classification problems where you have more uh, than more than one class. Um, one example that's kind of well known is in um, reading digits in an optical character recognition system. There you've got, um, you know, kind of there's 10 different digits from zero to nine. And, uh, you, know, the, you, you know, these days, you know, this is a kind of a common, certainly it's an important practical thing to recognize handwritten digits, but it's also kind of a standard test bed for, uh, you know, for, for neural network systems, just because there's a lot of data out there and people use this for exercises. One thing to note is when you're classifying things into more categories, classification becomes a harder category, a harder problem. Um, you know, when, when you have uh, two categories, a monkey can get an accuracy of 50% by just randomly guessing. When you have 10 categories, the monkey can only get 10% accuracy, okay, by just randomly guessing. So how do you evaluate multi-class systems? Um, one thing that I would say is it's very good to build a confusion matrix. What is a confusion matrix? On one side, I should have probably labeled it better, is the real label. And on the other side is the predicted label. And um, this says how often, when it was re of the examples that really were a four, how many of them got predicted as a four? To interpret the uh, what you call it, the confusion matrix, right? You're certainly hoping that um, the numbers will lie on the main diagonal. The main diagonal are the right predictions. Okay, so the more weight that you have on the main diagonal, the better off you are. Um, the, you know, what you call it. The, um, but what's important with the confusion matrix is it shows you where you're making your mistakes. So if we take a look at this, where are the largest numbers on here that are not on the main diagonal? Here is one of 11 mistakes that was kind of an argument that that five and three were easily confused by the classifier. Looked like two and eight, eight and two, had a relatively large number. That meant that that was relatively easily confused. By building one of these confusion matrices, it kind of shows you where you're making mistakes. And that's kind of a useful thing to know. Any questions? Here was a confusion matrix that came from a system that we built. Um, we were trying to date documents. Um, so you would like to be able to read a section of a, uh, what you call it, uh, take a piece of text from a, 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 a book that was printed in 1937 and guess what year it was written, okay? So what was this confusion matrix? Here we had a world where in some sense, there were 200 different classes. Um, you know, every year that a document could have been written from 1800 to 2000. Um, and 
to make the confusion matrix more smaller, okay, we would, you know, we, in this case, the, uh, the, 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 the years kind of collapse into naturally into smaller classes. You could think about breaking the classes up by decade. You know, if you can have a lot of classes, grouping the decade, the, the classes by similarity gives you a, you know, an easier way to, to look at it. You get it in the general bin as opposed to the exact label. Um, and so here we group them according to uh, what 20 year period was the document written and, uh, you know, and what did we predict it as? If you look at this confusion matrix, what you see is, yes, in general, more of the weight is along the, the main diagonal, okay, which is, you know, what you'd kind of like to see. But it's not perfectly along the main diagonal. This, I think, is the main diagonal. And if we do that, you'll see that there are, are mistakes that are being made. For example, we're often confusing documents that were actually written in the 80s with documents that were written in the 2000s, okay? But that's a relatively forgivable error, okay? But we can see that there kind of are drifts. Our classifier is probably less good up here because uh, you see sort of more weight further from the, from the, um, from the main diagonal. And we're gratified not to see incredible mistakes. This is a bad mistake. What's a bad mistake? This is an example of a bad mistake. Because that was a document that was written in the 1860s that we, we thought was in the 2000s. Okay? But a confusion matrix gives you a way to look at these things in ways that uh, I find it quite interpretable. Any questions? Um, one thing about multi-class classification that is a, a, a good hint is that um, if you make the problem too hard, you're going to do very badly at it. And that's actually something, you know, that's a problem if you want to brag to your boss, but it's a problem for other kinds of reasons. Let's say that we had had, you can imagine something like Im ImageNet is a famous, uh, challenge in computer vision where they have images of a thousand different types and you have to try to predict what type of image is it is this a cat is it a building is it a dog is it a a, a sofa is it a whatever if you have um a thousand um what you call it classes what would the monkey do okay what would be the accuracy of a monkey you're just randomly guessing among the thousand classes. 0 0.001. Okay, you know, the accuracy is going to be extremely low. And it's so low that it's very hard. When it gets the, the accuracy, the problem gets hard enough, the changes in the accuracy may not really reflect how well the classifier is doing. It could represent luck. You know, at some point, if you know, you know, you know, if, if you win the lottery, are you particularly good at, at picking lottery numbers? The answer is no, you just got lucky. Yeah, when you're dealing with multi-class classification problems is to um, find a way to, to, to give yourself enough credit that you'll be able to tell the difference between a good and a bad system. And so one thing is, instead of reporting the accuracy, how often did you get it right? You might report the top K success rate. What does the top K success rate? Suppose, let's say that, um, that you, uh, what you call it? That, that you give yourself credit if the right label was one of the, 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 the you're allowed to pick K different labels for the item. And you win if the real label was one of those K. Okay. Any questions about that? What's better about getting a system, evaluating your system 
by the top k rate? Well, you can always pick a k where you're like you're going to get a, a get credit for a non-trivial fraction of things. For example, if we thought about the monkey in the uh, what you call it in the uh, um, you know image net where you had a thousand categories. If you said the top 100 rate, how often was the label that you picked among the top 100? The monkey would bat 10%. But if you have a system that's pretty good, it's probably going to get closer to 80 or 90%. Okay? And by picking the appropriate K, you can get, uh, you can make the problem easy enough that class, you know, a reasonable classifier will get 50 or 60% right. And that gives you a way to tell if your classifier is better than a, you know, if a good classifier is better than that. Um, any questions about that? It should be clear that if I give you credit for, um, for picking, you know, you don't have to get the right label, but you have to, you're given, you know, K choice, K, K, K guesses. You're more likely to get it right if you give you K guesses. And if you pick the right K, you can make it so you have some level of success with your classifier and you can still tell whether or not it gets better with time. Okay, any questions? Um, when you're dealing with regression systems, regression systems were ones where, uh, you know, you were making a numerical prediction instead of an, uh, a, uh, an you know, instead of a label prediction. Um, there are a couple of uh, different ideas. One is you can categorize the, the error, okay, on one of your predictions in terms of the absolute error, namely the forecast, okay, minus the observed. Or you can think about a relative error, okay, which is the what what the what came out of your prediction your regression function minus the actual value divided by the actual value this will measure your your error in units that are um what you call it uh that that that, that are consistent with the units that the item was measured this one will will um, measure the error in units something like a uh, you know a percentage. Okay. Any questions about that? You can also um, sometimes people will take the absolute error and square it and compute over a bunch of examples the mean squared error. Okay or equivalently the square root of this thing. Um, that's the root mean squared error. What is, let's say, what is the difference in an evaluation system between something that's measuring the absolute error and the absolute square and the, the squared error? If you think about it, when you're setting an evaluation system, you want to think what are you actually trying to reflect. If we score ourselves according to the absolute error, which maybe is the absolute value of forecast minus observed versus the square of it, what is the difference? Okay, so first of all, if we just talk about the absolute error, you're saying you get positives and negatives. And of course, if you average those things, it'll come out to zero even if you have big swings. So that's probably not it. But what if I take the absolute value of it? Under what, what would be different if I score myself according to the sum of the absolute errors or the sum of the squared errors? Yeah? Right, the square the squared error is going to be more sensitive to the outliers. If you have one thing that's two units off versus two things that are one units off, 
on the absolute on the absolute error they're the same under the squared error okay the one that has one unit two times off is i think twice as bad okay so um so that's what the decision is are you interested in the average the, the the general case or are you interested in the outliers okay that's one thing that uh that, that you have to think about when you pick that uh that measure um again calling it the square root of the mean squared error the root mean squared error just makes it more like a standard deviation okay and so people kind of think in terms of, of that as comparable to um, in terms of the absolute units. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So you should think about what it is you're actually trying to care about when you're making these kind of forecasts. Um, now, when you're trying to evaluate a system, there are issues about how do you, you know, run the day, you know, what do you, um, what data do you evaluate it on? And there is this, this notion that if you evaluate it on the training data, you're living in sin, you're trying to make predictions about things you already know the answer to. Um, often systems look like they're doing much, much better than they really are based on, um, what you call it? Uh, you know, if, if the training data somehow works its way into the evaluation data. So the best way to tell how good a model is, I always feel, is if you can get out of sample predictions, if you have data that is um, way outside, that, that is something you didn't know about, ideally, at the time that you were building your model, that's the best thing. When we think back to Nate Silver, sort of predicting what the poll review was going to be, you know, he doesn't know what the answer, who's going to win the election in advance. He doesn't know what the future holds. Okay. But uh, so evaluating him on the elections when they actually do happen. Okay. Is, is, is a fair way to do it. Generally, however, you guys are going to have to get your data in one batch at the same time. If so, it becomes important to, uh, partition the data into two or ideally three different categories. Certainly by now you've seen from the Kegel ones that they gave you training data and you know, you then had to submit your thing for evaluation. Um, the, you know, and, and that you, you, you do that at the end. Um, Often people split the problem is into what they would call training, testing, and evaluation data. You know, the, the, the training is what you will use to build a particular model. Often you're going to build several different models on, on that data, that, that data. Okay. And, um, you know, to evaluate and compare those models before you really tell how you do at the end it's good to sort of have a second trench that's going to be used to evaluate. Let's say you, you built a regression model. You built a, um, you know, a uh, support vector machine model. You built a couple of different models. Evaluating how well those models did compared to each other is something you can do on the testing data. If you want to then know how is it going to perform in practice, you need to kind of evaluate it on a third tranche of data at the end, once you know what your final model is. Okay, otherwise, what you're going to end up doing is picking which of these three models did best on the testing data. Some of that performance is going to be explained by variance. The presumption is that when you run it on a final evaluation data, it will do less well than it did on the testing data because you picked the best, you know, the best of all the options there. Any questions? Okay. Now, one thing that, that is, you know, um, you know, again, if you think about what is the main sin that comes up with an evaluation is that, uh, what you call it? Um, 
is that people somehow mix testing and training data. Okay, this is kind of the biggest sin you see in evaluation. And it's often a little more subtle than just that, oh, I, I took my file and did it separately. Um, one possibility, for example, let's say you wanted to build a model to predict, um, you know, some label, let's, let's say male or female, from people who tweet, okay? One perfectly fine thing to do might be to, uh, or one obvious thing might be to take a whole collection of tweets and split it into here 60% for training, 20% for evaluation, 20% for testing. Notice that there's going to be some of the same people. If a, if a person has more than one tweet, okay, they might very well have t tweets that are in both testing and training and evaluation. You could be learning about the building a model that learns about the person from the testing tweets. Okay, if one of the things you had to say as a feature was a, a, a user ID, well, it could very well be that you're, 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 when you try to evaluate it, what you're really going to be doing is, you know, there's kind of a mix now between testing and training, even if none of the tweets are in common, so long as the people who did the tweeting was in common. Okay, sometimes people will try to evaluate how to predict sales at a store, okay, or in some economic conditions. If you have one store and you break the test data over time into several chunks, if the training data is here, it's going to learn a lot about the store that it can use kind of unfairly to predict the, the time periods that are kind of held out separately for testing. So everybody kind of see what I'm, I'm saying. You can imagine a world where you're trying to build a model to predict sales at a store. If you had segregated your data in terms of you broke the store each time series into chunks, it's going to still kind of use something about the future, perhaps, when it is trying to build a model to predict the past. What would be a better way to break up your time series would be the early part of the time series would be used for training. Then the next part would be used for testing. And the final part used for evaluation. That way, that, that's another area, way to make sure that you're not kind of putting the, uh, the testing results, okay, are not somehow dependent upon things that were already in the training data. Any questions? Okay, so that's often a sin that I kind of see. When, you, when, I, when we build a model, okay, um, one thing that I find that is very useful and may be useful to some of you in your projects is it's good to build a evaluation environment before you build your model, um, if possible. And ideally, it's something that you can run with this one command that kind of produces a comprehensive set of results on your model. So you're sure to run it each time and you keep these comparisons to compare as it goes over time. The input would be your evaluation mod system, okay? Um, there is a model that is kind of embedded in the testing system. That's what you're, 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 you're currently doing. And you want it to produce the summary statistics at the time that you're running it. So this is what I think an ideal kind of evaluation environment looks like. You have a, a piece of code that, um, what do you call it, ha takes as input your validation data. It takes as input your model. It runs your model on your validation data. And it produces several different kinds of evaluations. It will produce a performance statistics. How well is it doing? What do the errors look like? What do the confusion matrices look at like? Ideally, it will produce the whole suite of statistics so that you can evaluate your model and see, see how happy you are with it. Any questions? Um, 
And again, when you have a uh, evaluation system, I think it is important to produce the error distribution, not just what was the root mean squared error, but what was the distributions of what the errors look like. Ideally, your errors in a regression system will be a bell-shaped curve. If you see spikes, that probably tells you something, okay? Um, and it outputs the summary statistics that matter so you can compare different versions and uh, see what you say about it. Any questions? So on that book dating project, when we built our test environment, one of the things we did, remember this was supposed to be to try to tell us um, what year our document was. When we did a random evaluation, an evaluation will be just of a baseline, where we randomly guessed a year from, um, you know, 1800 to 20 to 2000. This was the error statistic that we got, the absolute error. What does that plot say? Does that plot say anything about absolute error that looks weird to you? The mean is not zero. That's one thing it shows you. It shows you that when you were guessing what year it was, randomly, you were more likely to make positive errors than you were negative errors. Does anybody think what that might have meant? Well, a, a positive error would be the book was written in 1980, and it was, uh, and we said it was 2000. You're right. That's a positive error. Why did it was it lopsided like that? Okay. Can anyone think of a scenario where it would be lopsided if we're just picking a random year? Anyone on television? Turned out that we did not have an equal number of documents from every year. As you know, that there were fewer books published in 1800 than there are now. Okay, and so this is one thing that it kind of reflected. So this reminded us something about what the test data was. When we built the model that we kind of like, which happened to be a naive Bayes model, which we'll talk about a little later, this one looked better to us. You know, the histogram was clearly baked. There was a strong emphasis of errors around, you know, zero. It was symmetric. This kind of uh, made us happier. Any questions? But again, if you have a good visualization, you can see what's going on. The other thing that our env evaluation environment for this project did was it um, broke down when we were trying to date the articles, books and articles. Um, it broke the test cases into different cohorts so we could kind of understand it. This was the random one. This was the good um, model. But we broke it into different categories. We broke it into tests that were articles from the New York Times. We took it, at, took it a look at things that were from fiction books, and we stratified the cases by how long a text we gave um, each article. We gave, gave the classifier. Did we give it 100 words? Did we give it 500, 1,000, 2,000? And we did it separately for news, articles and for fiction okay when did we keep track we kept track of what was the absolute error we kept track of the mean absolute error the median absolute error and the accuracy now accuracy we only gave ourselves credit for if we got the year exactly right remember they were 200 years right what do we learn from the breakdown does anybody see anything about our results from the breakdown that tell us something about our classifier or anything like that? How would we interpret those results? Does anybody see anything that, that tells them anything about what's going on? The more uh, work that we give to the, our model, uh, the better we are. 
So one thing that's clear is that if we're trying to predict how long the text is, how old the text is, the longer the, te the longer the passages we give, the lower the absolute error, right? That's one thing that we're seeing. And this kind of makes sense. If I ask you to date, I'm going to give you one word from a document. The, how old is the book? You know nothing, right? But the more you see, maybe the more likely you'll catch an archaic word or a word that was invented recently or something like that. Um, what else do we learn from this? We agree that with more text, it, um, it gets better. Is that effect kind of slowing down? When we look at the error that we're getting, here we doubled the size of the text, and we only got it, it looked like one year, lowered the error by one year. Okay? So it does look like our effect is kind of saturating here. And that, you know, I don't think we would do much better on length, text of length 10,000 than we're doing with length 2,000. Anything else people see here when you look at this? Any other observation from that test set? The news of article are less uh, sensitive about the length of... The news articles, if we look at it, um, you're saying the news articles are saturating much quicker. By the time we get up to something of size of 500 words, we're almost as good as it's going to get. Okay? Does this make sense? Well, most news articles are probably shorter. Is news articles or fiction, which are easier? Which do we do better on? News articles. Does that make sense that if you wanted to try to guess when an article was made? You know, if they're busy talking about Harry Truman and how he's going to, you know, have to send the atomic bomb over to Japan or something like that. That then is probably an article that was not written, you know, in, in 1920 before you had an atomic bomb. It was probably written during the time of that historical figure. So you would expect that you would do better on, um, you know, on news. And news articles, usually I guess the, the head of the news article is designed to tell you the story, a lot about the story. Maybe that's the reason why shorter texts give you more accuracy. Uh, and you, you're able to get decent accuracy with shorter texts. Any questions about that? Yeah. Why does it get saturated with, uh, when we add more data? Why does it get saturated when you add more and more data? Well, I'm going to guess that for certain articles, you probably can't really tell. So there are a couple of reasons why this might be. First of all, you would expect that there's a law of diminishing returns in most things in life. You know, as you add more and more um, features, you would generally expect each feature is going to tell you less new stuff than the stuff before, right? So thinking about the law of diminishing returns would probably be it. Now, why does it reach a limit? Well, it's not completely clear it reaches a limit, that if you gave me the whole book, I could probably t do better than if you gave me 2,000 words. But you can also imagine that the ones that you can't tell after 2,000 words probably are generally hard to guess. Let's say that we had a, a person today wrote a novel about the past. You could imagine a world where if I'm writing a book today about cowboys, okay, I couldn't tell really if I did a good job writing it, the cowboy is not going to be driving off, flying out in an airplane. The cowboy is going to be riding a horse and he's going to be doing whatever cowboys did, okay? So you could imagine a world where, where there are texts that, that probably are just hard to do, are fairly ambiguous, and it's not clear that the longer it gets, it suddenly provides you with that clue. That's why it would probably stabilize, okay? Another reason why it might stabilize in general might be because you, they did a bad job labeling when the book was written. 
For example, um, you know, if you take a book by Charles Dickens, how do you figure out what year a book is written? Well, it could be when it was published. That would seem like the, you know, normally when you get a, uh, a buy, when you buy a book, it doesn't tell you when it was written. It tells you when it was published, right? Now, if you read a book by Charles Dickens, there's a copyright date in it, okay? If let's say the publisher wants to have the look, keep the copyright or something like that, they will usually use a modern date on it. You could imagine some of these are mislabeled examples, you know, where in fact they are, they are old books that are marked new. I think that's probably more likely than new books that are marked old, okay? And so there are a lot of reasons why I don't think you're going to eventually get to a perfect classifier here, okay? Because it's probably, it's, you know, it's not a, trivi a hard problem, it, it, you know, it's a somewhat hard problem. And, you know, there are many different confounds. Any questions? Okay, good. Um, and again, the, uh, you know, the, there, there is this question of if I, okay. My favorite, I'll tell you my favorite joke, okay, for, for this time of year, which is you guys are coming here to, um, uh, okay. Why is it that, what's the holiday that's coming up in the next week? Christmas, right? What? Halloween. Oh, I always make that mistake. Why is it? You guys know about octal numbers? Base 8 numbers? You guys know about binary numbers, right? What is a number in octal? Base 8. What is octal 25? Octal 31. What is that? That's 3 times 8 plus 1, right? That means that oct 31 is equal to des 25. What is this? What happens in December 25th? Christmas. Okay. Does everybody get that? Maybe you don't, I don't know if that sounded funny or not. Now, what happens if I tell it again? Is it going to be more or less funny than that? Some of you may be saying it can't be less funny than it was the first time. But it's certainly true it can't be more funny the second time, right? And again, once you know the answer, okay, when you evaluate the model, you can easily kind of make excuses for it or you don't understand it and stuff like that. The key point is that if you're going to evaluate how good a model is, you really have to look at data that you know you haven't seen before. And that's why I kind of like the out of sample data. Any questions? Okay. Now there is one important technique that uh, I do want to talk about for a world where you do not have enough data. Again, in an ideal world, what would you do if you're training a model? You have a lot of data. You can take 60% of it um, to uh, what you call it, to uh, use for training, 20% for testing and hold out another 20% for evaluation. And if you have enough data, that 60% for training is more than enough and everyone's happy. Now, often you don't really get uh, enough training data to you know, comfortably and reliably train and evaluate a model. Has anybody built a classifier where they had very little, few examples? Yeah, what was yours? It was about what? Concentration. Whether it was something about that. There were parameters that you have to predict whether it is the Will it be viable for that uh, experiment or not? Okay, so, so how many examples did you have? Uh, I think so, 60. He had 60 examples, okay? Now suppose n equals 60. Now again, this is typically, you were saying, I gather it was some kind of chemistry thing. So, you know, I gather somebody had to sit and mix things in a test tube and then either something lit up or it didn't light up. 
You could say, I need a million training examples, in which case the chemist would say, take a hike, right? You can't go and send them into the lab a million times to mix these things and see what lights up. So what could you do in a world where you only have 60 examples, okay? If you follow the suggestion that I, that I said before, we'll divide it into two, three categories. One with 60% would have 36 examples. One with 20% would have what? 12 examples. And then the final evaluation would be done on 12 items. Now he could do this, but notice that, first of all, notice that training on 36 items is kind of bad. That's not much more than his in total data set. That's half, almost not much more than half his data set. Um, the evaluation on 12 items in particular seems bad because there's a tremendous amount of variation. If he happened to pick the weird experiments to be in the evaluation set, his model will look bad. If he happened to pick the good, you know, the easy ones for the evaluation set, his evaluation will look good. So when you get into a training situation where you have very, very few examples, the idea of using cross-validation is a good idea. What if instead of breaking it up once into 60% Let's think of it, let's say 60%, um, well, of course, the, you don't really have the luxury about testing and evaluation. Instead of breaking it up into one example of 60% for training and 40% for evaluation, well, now let's make it a little different. Instead of breaking it up so you have 20% for evaluation and 80% for training, what if you in, instead did the following? You took the data, you partitioned it into five different chunks, and you trained the model on the first chunk and evaluated it on the last chunk. That's kind of what we were talking about doing before. But then, let's say we go back and repeat. We train a model on these four pieces and then evaluate it on here. This is going to be a different model, okay, but trained the same type of model. Maybe it's regression. But notice that you're training on some examples and evaluating it on ones that are not in it. This is going to give you the performance of a different regression model. You could imagine building a total of five different regression models based on which fifth you left out of the data set. The one that you left out, you trained on, okay? And now what do you get? Instead of getting one accuracy on the training set, you've got five different accuracies on a training set of the same size, on a testing set of the same size. And now you can average the performance of the models. And this gives you, in some sense, a way that you can get more evaluation data out of your model, OK, by simply repeating the procedure of your testing and training on it. Any questions about that? In the original world, you had one model and one evaluation. Now I've got K models and K evaluations, okay? And um, what's good about that? Well, one thing that's good is uh, I get a variance because I have a bunch of five different models. I can see what the difference of the performance of each of these models is, okay? If the difference of the performance of these models is not very much, then probably I can believe the accuracy that I observe. If I see a lot of variance among these different models, that's something that I'm more suspicious of. Okay? Any questions about that? And, uh, you know, 
the limiting case of this idea is what they call leave one out validation. How many models could he have built? If he had 60 examples, he could actually have built 60 different models by leave, in each case leaving one item out. You take 59 items, train a regression, evaluate it on the last item. You either do good or bad. You now uh, take an, an, put that item back in the set, pull out a different one. In principle, you could come up with 60 different models, and now your evaluation set is going to be of size 60 instead of size 1, okay? Or instead of size 12 if you had done the partitioning the way that we did. And this can give you a... The good thing is it can give you a way to come up with a, a reasonable evaluation for a small size data. What is the cost of doing this? Okay, so the advantage of doing the leave one out cross validation is that now you have as many evaluation cases as you have training cases, right? What's the cost of doing leave one out cross validation? The evaluation is binary? Well, first of all, if it was a regression model, you would get an absolute an error for each prediction. So that's not really that's not really true. This works just as well for regression systems than it does as labeling systems. Is there a cost for doing this? You have to do a lot, you spend a lot more time in training. If your model was expensive to train, it, it, it will, this will cost 60%, 60 times as much training time as you would have had otherwise, right? Um, and uh, so, so that's kind of where I think the problem is. The other question is, which model should you use at the end? Now you've got 60 different models. Which is the one that you should use for your application? What? One possibility you're saying is to vote. So you could imagine now building, um, you know, taking all 60 models and using them. Um, now, in general, do we think the models are going to be very different from each other? Okay. Each, every pair of these models is going to have 59, something like 58 elements of the training data in common and one element different, right? So do we think the models are going to be wildly different? Probably not. So what would be a candidate for what model you should use in this case? I would probably just go and train one model on the 60. Once, once I know the performance of these kinds of things with 59 training examples, if, if I get a, re, you know, a, a reasonably steady performance on these things, maybe I should just build a model trained on all 60 items, and that's the one that I would use in practice. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So for problems where you have very, very few test Exam training examples, cross validation is a very important technique. Any questions? Okay, good. What other ways are there to, um, you know, let's say, uh, deal with um, improving evaluation in a world where you have uh, small numbers of examples? One possibility is, um, you, know, you know, so let's say you wanted to, to train something where you had, again, we've had the case of the 60 chemical reactions is actually a good one. What kind of other techniques might you do? Well, one thing that sometimes people will do is, um, you know, construct similar synthetic examples for training, okay? by perturbing slightly what happened at the, uh, you know, on the input. Again, on your thing, how many columns did you have? You had 60 examples, how many columns? Five features. Five features, okay. 
So, what, you know, I'm guessing there are things like what was the temperature and what was the salinity and uh, stuff like this. You could imagine adding some noise to the underlying features and, const you know, constructing synthetic examples, okay, and giving them the same label as the original, okay? That might be one way to get more training and evaluation data. Hopefully you do it in a way it doesn't ruin what makes the case interesting. But uh, that's something to think about. Often it's important to get into a world where you're giving partial credit. If I was building a classifier and I wanted to evaluate it, um, you know, where I had a classifier on 60 things, ideally I would not just get a label, predict it's going to be positive or negative, but I'd get a probability of how confident I was in that prediction. You could imagine that if I, you know, you'd like it to be the case that on the ones that it got right, it was very, very confident. And on the ones that it got wrong, it was less confident. And you could imagine how you can enrich the, um, what you call it, the, the, the value of your test cases, where instead of reducing them to yes, no, you basically grade them on a curve. Okay? Any questions about that? Um, the other thing is sometimes you get into situations where positive examples are, are rare, okay? And maybe you have them. Let's say you wanted to build test data for terrorist detection, okay? My guess is that, that if the FBI was building something to try to detect terrorists, they probably have, how many terrorists do you think that they have known about over the years? I am gonna guess 100. I don't think, you know, they're not, they, they don't make that many terrorists, okay? If you wanted data on a non-terrorist, how would you create data on a non-terrorist? How do you know that someone is not a terrorist? This is a hard question, right? You could basically just assume that um, if terrorists are rare, if you pick people at random who are not known to be terrorists, they probably aren't terrorists, okay? And so sometimes you can, um, you know, get examples on one side where there's a lot of them. Um, and by just assuming, if you, all you know are the positive ones, if they are rare, almost anything else can be likely assumed to be negative. Any questions? Okay, any questions about, that's where I'm gonna stop this for now. Any questions on evaluation? One way or another. Yeah. Sorry, let me go back there. Can we repeat that? More than k times, for example, uh, I think randomly it's all items of out of 60 and repeat it for. Okay, so what you're saying is you want to do this even more, okay? You could instead say, what if in, right now, with, with, with cross, with, with, in this case, the way that I'm proposing with the case of n equals 60, I said in leave one out, you're going to train a model where you're going to pull one item out, train on the rest, and evaluate it. You're saying, what if I don't want to, what if I want to train more than 60 classifiers in this case? One possibility is, each one is going to be built on a, I'm going to take a random partition of my training and testing. Okay, I'm, I'm randomly partition my 60 examples into training and testing, maybe 80, 20. Okay, and evaluate it on the 20. I could then repeat it by doing another completely random sample. That's what your sign is suggesting. The good thing is there are two to the n random subsets of n things, okay? There's going to be, you know, if you pull out k of them, there's n choose k, different subsets of k examples. You can construct more of them. Each of them is independent. That is a perfectly fine idea, okay? 
What is the good thing about it? Well, when you're doing it, you're going to be evaluating it on a, each one of your random samples. You're going to be evaluating on a larger number of things. So if let's say you pulled out 12, you know, you, you took the, 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 the 60 things and you had 48 for training and 12 for evaluation. You could build an arbitrary number of these classifiers. Okay, you could evaluate them. You're evaluating them each on a larger sample. That sounds good. The downside is you're training them on a smaller example. But again, you have what in my mind is a perfectly good idea. If you're really going to do the partition at ran and the testing and training at random, then that's a perfectly valid thing. Any questions? Any other questions about evaluation? Okay, the evaluation I'd like to talk about now is about your project proposal. So let me just get back to here. Okay, so um, first of all, you guys did a good job of getting your uh, peer evaluations in on time so that they could be evaluated. And the TAs also did a good job getting their uh, peer evaluations in. Um, I was gratified when, again, what did we do? We, we analyzed the peer evaluations. We, um, one thing I always do is compare, uh, correlate the final rankings. This is a Spearman correlation between the rankings of the, um, what do you call it, the TAs and the, uh, what do you call it, the, the score we accumulate for peers. And on all projects, there was, you know, what I consider to be perfectly fine um, correlation between what the TAs and the, the peers gave. Perfectly fine does not mean um, perfect. Perfect would be a correlation of one. Okay. But generally believing, you know, I, I believe that the, uh, the average of the peer score and the TA score is the most informative one. So um, that's what you guys should all have gotten. Is that, am I correct? Everybody's gotten there. Um, true or false? Did every team get its uh, evaluation now? Yes. Is that, is that yes? Okay, good. That's what I thought. Um, what I'd like to do now is to go through the, um, the primary uh, comments that were made for each project. What's important? First of all, Generally speaking, the correlation between the peers and the TAs is going to increase in time because you're going to get, as your projects get more and more developed, they will more obviously break down into good versus bad. Okay? So I expect even more agreement later on, but I'm very happy with what I see here. But what, would, what I want from to make sure is that every group knows what it's supposed to do do right now to make a better project for the progress report. Um, you know, when I was reading the projects, some of the projects, you know, I didn't wasn't proposed, I wasn't convinced that the teams really knew what they need, were going to do next. Hopefully, your team knows what it's going to do next. Okay, if it doesn't, then that's where you've got to get more guidance from your captain, or uh, think about it and stuff like this, or talk to me or something like that. What were the um, main, let's say, things that each, each uh, captain thought about their projects? So for the people who did the Twitter and circadian rhythm, and I was the one that created these, um, at some point people were talking about differences between doctors and nurses and say, see how there's a big difference well, if there's a big difference, you should be able to show that with a significance test. And um, many times, some of the things groups were claiming as big differences weren't really that big. Okay, and so you should be able to convince yourself whether it's going to be real. Um, many of the groups said that they're going to get more data. Okay, and um, uh, Professor Jones has... Uh, 
is, is already preparing um, more uh, a data set with uh, a similar, you know, with the same basic columns that you have now for more professions. I think it will be about a thousand professions at the end. Um, but several groups said, in order to test when people are going to be sleeping, they want to get more data. Um, and they're going to use the Twitter API. Generally speaking, they didn't kind of make clear what they were looking for. Okay, it's one thing to say, I'm going to get more data, I'm going to use the Twitter API. But the API has limits, it has practical limits, because there's only a certain amount of time between now and then. It has rate limits from the company. Um, it has, uh, and you know, kind of, you, you want to get your data in a way that's going to be answering a question that you have. And often I didn't see evidence that th that was really thought out. So if you're gonna get data on this or any of the other projects, the quicker you start, the better. And the more purposeful you're doing your data acquisition, the better off you are. Um, some people use certain echo, your know, geolocation things. They, so, you know, you had to kind of correct for the time zone. Um, and some people did, some people didn't. Um, some people called black boxes to try to do the geolocation. You should know how good or bad your geolocation is. If somebody says that they're from Washington as their location for, for where they, they, they're, they're tweeting from, you know, what does your uh, geolocation tag do? Does it say, yes, they're from Washington State in the Pacific time zone, or do they say they're from the nation's capital? Or do they say they don't know? And that's the kind of thing that you should know that I didn't think people knew. Any groups that did this project have any questions or comments? Okay. On the flight delay uh, project, again, I didn't grade these, but this is what these were from the DAs. What kind of responses did they get? One thing that uh, I gather is that you had data on a lot of different airlines and airports. If you want to understand flight delays, you probably want to understand it at the big airports more than you want to understand it at an airport that doesn't have very many flights going in and out of. And, you know, because there's probably a power law distribution on the number of flights that go into airlines. There's a small number of airports that get huge numbers of flights. There are a lot of airports, a large number of airports that have very, very few flights, like Islip. Okay, Islip's a great airport, but not as many flights as we would like. And uh, if you want to understand delays, that's important to figure out. Um, if you're trying to explain what's causing flight delays, okay, what what kind of things matter here? Well, um, you probably want to understand what causes them more than just build a complicated model where you have huge numbers of features. For one thing, there's a diminishing law of returns as you add more features. But more than that, things get confusing. Okay, is something due to the weather? Is it due to something else? Is it due to volume at airports? Things like that. Um, you know, some groups, many of the groups talk about collecting weather and they're gonna predict, use the weather for prediction. You need to think a little bit about what the effect of the, the granularity of the phenomena is. Today we have horrible weather here. Um, is this going to cause flight delay delays in Arizona? Where, uh, and you're saying, I see someone said no. And the answer is, of course, it's going to cause delays in Arizona because there's probably planes that flew here that ultimately end up in Arizona. Okay. And so the question of where, where the, uh, you know, where the predictions are, how, you know, thinking about what weather you're worried about. There's an effect here that, yes, the planes are not going to want to land when there's terrible rains and wind, okay? But there's other things. Make sure you get it on the right scale. And again, if you're going to get data from someplace, I encourage you to do get your data now because many of you are going to give me sad faces 
in uh, late November where they said, oh, I just started doing my data and I can only get a thousand records a day and there's only five days till the project is due. Okay. Any questions about that? The last line is that we decide about how early you are running the prediction model and collect data accordingly. So I didn't understand that. Well, you know, again, there is a different question, but if, if all you're basing it on is what is the current, you know, if, if the flight lays are a delay, a function of when the plane is landing, okay, then you're only going to collect data, weather data at the moment each plane lands, where it lands. Are you also going to collect flight data, uh, weather data about where it was that the plane took off? Okay. Um, or for the rest of the country and how much longer ago? I can guarantee you that the rain we have right now is going to mess up flights for beyond the time that it took to, uh, for the rain to go away because there will be other airports that still have this kind of problem, right? And the planes may have gotten stuck here that were needed in Arizona and things like that. So you have to think about, again, I want you to start out by using something simple. That's really what you're talking about with number two. But make sure that you're using the, the, the granularity. What, if you're thinking about weather, what is the factor you're worrying about? If you're only worried about conditions at landing, then you only need it now. If you're worried about delays in a, in a complicated system, you probably need to know this for the whole country. Okay? You think about that. Any other questions? For the COVID vaccination, there were um, many groups had kind of uninformative plots. I saw some of that, that in my, my things. Obviously, we've talked about it. The graphics have to start, tell the state story. The second point was that the, uh, you know, we're not just, it's, it's not completely about trying to predict what the vaccination is at a certain place. You presumably also want some kind of an exploration, explanatory model. In one sense, you could imagine a black box thing that just, you know, takes everything in, including the phase of the moon and predicts what the vaccination rate is accounting. The other is that you kind of isolate what the uh, factors are that really are causing differences in vaccination. The third point, which I think is actually a good one, is that um, there are a lot of different questions that can be asked about from the vaccination data. And you don't have to limit yourself to what was kind of written in the initial document or anything like that. If you can find an interesting question, you should go ahead and do it. Any questions? For, for the book segmentation problem, um, you know, uh, there, there's this question of you wanted to take the book and break it into chunks to tell me where were the happy moments, when were the sad moments, where was a murder, where was a stuff like that. Um, the first, apparently a lot of groups talked about doing this in a completely unsupervised way. The input would be some books and I'm going to, you know, uh, figure out, you know, if it's a murder, they must use the word murder in it. So I'm going to look for the word murder or something like that. It's good practice to, to probably annotate a few books to understand better what books look like and use for testing. This is kind of can be time ex, can, uh, expensive, but a certain amount of, of annotated data is probably good. Um, again, there was, uh, you know, um, people talked about using word embeddings. Word embeddings are good things. Okay, but what, what a word embedding is, there are many different types of word embeddings. They can diff each type can be trained on a different corpus. Okay, that's kind of a useful thing. Okay, so make you know think about that and see what you're doing. And uh, again, you could imagine a world where, um, you know, you might think of features as being single words, 
Notice that if you want to know what word North Korea means, you're not going to figure out what North Korea is by a combination of, you know, North and Korea. It's kind of a distinct thing. And so sometimes you need to use multiple word uh, patterns instead of single things. Any questions? For the job title data, again, this problem, what I would say is uh, the main thing that I think this job is, I would love to see the groups that, that do this project. I want you to come out with a data set that is really interesting and rich on all different kinds of job titles. So, um, so, so, so the important thing is to kind of develop a data set from a lot of other uh, data sets, possibly govern, government data, possibly other things. Where again, there's a row for every job title. And there are different columns for features of salary and happiness and number of people that are there and satisfaction and things like that. Yeah, there might be categorizations. Maybe each job is in a particular, you know, this job, if you are a, you know, a uh, professor, that might be a job in education. And there's other jobs in education. And you'd like to be able to have that kind of categorization of these things. That's important. The main thing that I would say is it's important that whoever's doing this or any other project, it's important you have a direction of what are you going to do between now and the uh, progress report. And if you don't have a direction you believe in, then it's important to think back and make sure you find one. Any questions? For fantasy football, some people talked about using social media to understand things. That's an interesting idea. But if so, you better make sure you really get that data early enough to analyze it, because that's probably going to take some work to get going. Um, you know, one question is, uh, in evaluating it, you can imagine taking a model and getting an error rate and saying, look, this is the best model I could build. That's useful. But it's also important that you put it into some kind of context. You could imagine training a model and it gets 60% right, and you're very proud of yourself. But when you find that the average, you know, idiot in, on the street can do 75%, that's less, that's less impressive. So it's important to create meaningful baselines, and it's important to, you know, compare your model against other things. Ideally against, if you're comparing it in a world where there's statistics about other managers, okay? or there are a few people who have teams and tell you how they do, that seems like a good thing to do. Um, you will probably have a, an issue where new players come along all the time, where you may not have as much statistics about their performance. How do you, you know, how do you model what a new player is? Okay. Um, well, you know, you know, in a, in, a, in a meaningful way, okay, is something to think about. Um, and again, he's encouraging you to do worry about features and building the data set. Running the thing on many different machine learning algorithms is probably less interesting. Okay, so we know that there are libraries that will let you do linear regression and support vector machines and and decision trees, and we'll talk about that later. But the, the, the bigger issue is, is, is building this and running it on many algorithms. Any questions? For the retrieval pattern one, um, uh, the ideas of knowing what products are, okay, and how products, you know, what products mean and what products are similar to each other seems important here. And so uh, building some kind of an embedding seems to be a good idea as we talk about it. Um, one thing that, that I would like you to do is if you're predict, trying to predict which items are going to get it picked up more frequently first or last, 
it's important to prove that you've got some kind of a model that does better than chance. That's the first thing to do. Either there is no signal, people just randomly put things out and, and scan them in a random order, or they don't. And so the first thing that I would want you to do is to try to look at some simple rules, okay? Sort them by, do, try what happened to, do, do, do bigger items get scanned before smaller items? Do cheaper items get scanned for more expensive items? Things like this. And see if you can sort of prove that there's something in the data there. Um, one thing that some people you might want is as much information as you can about the items before you uh, build your model. The data set, as far as I know, does not give you the height, the size and weight of an item. That would seem like an interesting thing to have access to. Where might you get it? Well, I know Amazon sells a lot of things, I am told. And for each one of these things, it might be, it, you know, there, there might be height and size and weight might be on the web page to be scraped. Okay, so don't be afraid to do something like that if you can do it with, you know, without being too obtrusive. Okay, any questions? And that's what I think all the projects are. Any questions about the proposals? Okay. So at this point, what I want you to do is to go and, uh, you know, start working on your, uh, your, your, the thing for your progress report. And uh, if you have questions about it, we can talk. Okay. Any questions? I've got two minutes till class expires. Uh, I'd like to do something rather than go to my slides. Yes. Okay. So again, first of all, if you don't understand what this means, each one of these slides was written by the captain of the project. So if let's say you don't know what it, if, if, if you don't know what it means, it's a perfectly fair thing to, to contact the captain and say, what does this mean? Um, what I'm interpreting here is that, that some people, groups, okay, may be interested in what is the time acquired for scanning a single item. You might imagine, let, let's say that one of the uh, items at the hardware store was a live horse. I don't know that they sell live horses, but you could imagine a horse that has its uh, uh, a UPC, a, a barcode on it, on, on it somewhere. It probably took a lot of time to turn the horse around to get it to the right place for you to scan it. Certain items might inherently require more time to scan. It's not just a question of when you pick them up, but it might be that some are easier to scan than others. And that might be something that you reflect in the data. Okay. You could imagine maybe a more, more, more realistically, some items, it may be hard. Like, for example, you could imagine a circular can of can. It might be harder to get the scan right than something where the barcode label was printed flat. Okay. If so, you might be able to prove that some items take longer to scan than others. That's what, um, what this is, what I'm thinking that that's about. That to me sounds like an interesting question. Can you prove that some items take dramatically longer to scan than other ones? That would mean that the, I guess for each item, you'd be counting the delta between the time before it was scanned and the time it was scanned. Are there ones that are, if you plotted a distribution of that, are there items that on average take much longer to scan? That would seem to me to be kind of an interesting question. That's what I think they're taking care of when they talk about this. Okay. And if so, I think that's interesting to study. Any questions? Okay. Now, now we, 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 we okay. Who should you contact? Professor Jones for the rest of the data? Contact the, the contact the um, uh, what you call it the the captains. I spoke with Professor Jones yesterday, and he you know I know he's working on it, um, but uh, if you nag the uh, the TAs enough, they will nag me, and I will then nag Professor Jones. 
If it's not here by the end of the week, um, I think that's that's something to uh, to to nag me about. Any questions? Okay, if not, thanks for your attention, and uh, I will see you guys on on uh, Thursday, and we'll talk about linear algebra. Okay, thank you.